This lesson will help you understand the constituent processes of service transition. Let us explore the objectives of this lesson in the next screen. After completing this lesson, you will be able to Describe the purpose, objective, and scope of transition, planning, and support. Explain the purpose, objective, and scope of change management. Describe the concept of Service Asset and Configuration Management, or SACM. Identify the purpose, objective, and scope of Release and Deployment Management. And explain the purpose, objective, and scope of Knowledge Management. Let us begin with the introduction to service transition processes in the next screen. The processes in service transition phase are critical as they influence and support all stages of the service life cycle. The processes include Transition, planning, and support provides plan and support for new or modified services and ensures orderly transition of services. Change management controls the life cycle of all changes and ensures balance between flexibility and stability. Service Asset and Configuration Management provides the information required to manage CIs and assets across the service lifecycle. Release and Deployment Management plans, builds, tests the releases, and deploys the services into customer environment. Knowledge Management gathers information, analyzes, and shares it with the organization to increase efficiency for the future. In the next screen, we will focus on the purpose, objective, and scope of transition planning and support process. Transition, planning and support is a process that includes planning and coordination for the activities involved in service transition. Click each tab to understand the purpose, objective and scope of change management. The purpose of service transition, planning and support is to provide overall planning for service transitions. In addition, it helps to coordinate the resources that are required to deliver the service. The objectives of the transition, planning, and support process are to plan and coordinate the resources to ensure that the requirements defined in service strategy stage are implemented in service design stage and are successfully released in service operation stage. Coordinate activities across projects, suppliers, and service teams where required. Provide clear plans that help the customer and the business change projects to align their activities with the service transition plans. Establish new or modified information systems and tools, technology and management architectures, service management processes, and measurement methods, and metrics to meet requirements defined during the service design lifecycle stage. Monitor and improve the performance of the service transition phase. The scope of the transition planning and support process is to maintain policies, models, and standards for the activities and processes in service transition. Coordinate the efforts needed to manage several transitions at the same time. Prioritize conflicting requirements for service transition resources and Review and improve the performance of activities related to transition planning and support. In the next screen, we will focus on change management. A change is a modification, addition, or removal of anything that could impact IT services. The impact may be altering the process or adding a CI. This includes the addition, modification, or removal of approved, supported, or baselined hardware, network, software, application, environment, system, desktop build, or associated documentation. For example, if a server with its defined configuration is a CI for a customer, any addition of memory to that server constitutes a change. Changes can be made either for proactive or reactive reasons. Examples of proactive reasons include cost reduction and service improvement. Examples of reactive reasons include solving service disruptions and adapting the service to a changing environment. The change management process is responsible for controlling the life cycle of all changes, from the inception of the change to the closure of the change. It is important to manage the change because it helps to optimize risk to business services, minimize the severity of any impact and disruption, and be successful at the first attempt.
In the next screen, we will focus on the purpose, objective, and scope of change management. Change management covers changes to baselined service assets and configuration items across the whole service lifecycle. Click each tab to understand the purpose, objective, and scope of change management. The purpose of the change management process is to control the life cycle of all changes and help in making beneficial changes with minimum disruption to IT services. The objectives of the change management process are to respond to business and IT requests to ensure alignment of services with business needs, ensure that changes are introduced in a controlled manner, thus optimizing business risk, implement changes timely and successfully to meet business needs, and use the standard processes and record every change. The scope of change management covers changes to baseline service assets and configuration items across the whole service lifecycle. It could happen in service strategy phase or in service design phase, for example, change in service portfolio, or at a tactical level in service operations phase, for example, addition of two new servers. The scope includes any changes to all architecture, tools, metrics, processes, and documentation. Addition, removal or modification of a service or a configuration item or an associated documentation. And changes to any of the five aspects of service design. In the next screen, we will focus on change model. A change model refers to predefined set of steps, policies, and procedures for assessing, authorizing, and executing a specific type of change. Change models help to save costs, minimize risk, and improve the consistency of execution around changes. The change model should include steps to handle changes, including unexpected events and issues, the chronological order in which these steps should be taken, with any dependency or co-processing defined, responsibilities as in who should do what, including identification of change authorities, who will authorize the change and decide whether formal change evaluation is needed, thresholds and timescales for completion of the actions, and escalation procedures including who should be contacted and when. In the next screen, we will discuss the types of change. The three change types or models are normal change, standard change, and emergency change. Normal change is a change that follows all of the steps of the change process. It is assessed by the change manager and approved by change advisory board. Standard change is a pre-approved change that has low risk, relatively common, and follows a defined procedure or work instruction. For example, password reset or provision of standard equipment to a new employee. Emergency changes are defined as a change that must be addressed quickly. Example to resolve a major incident or implement a security patch. The organization uses advanced process for handling emergency changes. They should be kept to minimum as the impact and failure chances are more for an emergency change. In the next screen, we will focus on some key terminologies related to service transition. Some of the key terms related to service transition are remediation planning, service change, request for change or RFC, and change proposal. Remediation planning refers to a recovery plan to a known state after a failed change or release. Before instigating the change, it is important to know if various remediation options are available. Once it is established that the remediation is viable, the risk of the proposed change is determined and appropriate decisions are taken. Service change refers to the addition, modification, or removal of an authorized, planned, or supported service component and its associated documentation. Request for change is a formal request for a service change and it can be raised or issued by anyone involved in the service. An RFC is standard form to capture and process all changes to any CI. Change proposal is raised for major changes with significant organizational or financial effects. In the next screen, we will focus on change proposal in detail. 
A change proposal is utilized to communicate a high-level description of any change that has occurred. It may include multiple changes. The change proposal is created in the service portfolio management process. It is then passed to the change management team for authorization. In some organizations, change proposals may be created by a program management office. A change proposal should include a high-level description of the new, changed or retired service, a business case including risks, issues and alternatives, financial requirements, and an outline schedule for design and implementation of the change. In the next screen, we will discuss the activities involved in a change management process. The image illustrates the different activities in a change management process. The change management process starts with a request for change or RFC. The RFC is logged in the change management system. The information is captured and tracked through to completion. An initial review is performed to filter RFCs that are incomplete or incorrectly routed. The RFCs are assessed. It may require involvement of the Change Advisory Board or the Emergency Change Advisory Board for business justification, impact, cost, benefit, and risk of the changes. This is authorized by the change manager. The change requester, in turn, will ensure that they have the approval of three main areas. The areas are financial approval, that is, what is it going to cost and what is the cost of not doing it? Business approval, that is, what are the consequences to the business and of not doing it? Technology approval, that is, what are the consequences to the infrastructure and of not doing it? Change management coordinates the work performed with multiple checkpoints. The change management team forwards approved changes to the relevant product experts to build and test the changes as well as create and deploy releases. Implemented changes are reviewed. This is called post-implementation review or PIR. If the change is successful, it can be closed. A key activity of change management is the assessment of the change request either by change manager or change advisory board. In the next screen, we will discuss the Change Advisory Board, or CAB. The Change Advisory Board is a consultative body that regularly meets to help the change manager assess, prioritize, and schedule the changes. The CAB is a group of experts with a clear understanding across the whole range of stakeholder needs. The change manager chairs the CAB, and the board may include representatives from all areas within the IT service provider, such as technical support, operations, development, service management, customers, other stakeholders, and third parties, such as suppliers. In short, People who are directly or indirectly affected by the changes should be a part of the CAB. Emergency CAB is a subset of the CAB organized by the change manager to advise on emergency changes. In the next screen, we will discuss the responsibilities of the change manager in detail. The key responsibilities of the change manager are to ensure the process is followed and authorize minor changes. To identify key stakeholder for the changes, the change manager coordinates with them and runs change advisory board meetings. To produce change schedule, ensuring all changes are scheduled without conflict and without causing a bottleneck to business requirements. To coordinate change, built, test, and implementation. To review or close changes by collating all the documentation around the changes to initiate post-implementation review meetings with the CAB. In the next screen, let us understand seven R's of change management. For proper impact assessment and understanding of benefits to risk, answers to the following seven questions are important. These questions must be asked for all changes. Without answers to these questions, the change assessment cannot be completed and the risk to benefit ratio cannot be understood. These questions are asked by the change manager 
or the CAB. Who raised the change? What is the reason for the change? What is the return required from the change? What are the risks involved in the change? What resources are required to deliver the change? Who is responsible for the build, test, and implementation of the change? What is the relationship between this change and other changes? In the next screen, we will understand how the change management process is measured through metrics. A metric is defined as something that is measured and reported to help manage a process, IT service, or activity. Key Performance Indicator, or KPI, is another term used in measuring performance. It is an important metric for that process, IT service, or activity. KPIs are selected to ensure that efficiency, effectiveness, and cost effectiveness are managed. Some of the metrics used in change management process are for compliance, decrease in number of unauthorized changes, decrease in number of emergency changes, maintain the integrity of the CIs and change. For effectiveness, that is, if the process is effective in delivering value, then there should be increased percentage of changes implemented which meet customers' requirements. There should be reduction in disruptions, defects, and rework. There should be reduction in changes failed or backed out. There should be a decrease in the quantity of incidents attributable to any change. For efficiency, the benefits gained, that is, value of change compared to cost incurred to do that change. Average time taken to implement by urgency or by priority or by type. The increased percentage of accuracy in change estimates. In the next screen, we will discuss the challenges by implementing and practicing the change management process. The key challenges faced by change management are business pressure. Organizations will come up with new initiatives for their business process and would pressurize for immediate execution of those ideas. Incomplete and inaccurate configuration management system or CMS. This leads to incomplete and inaccurate assessment of changes. Soiled technical function areas. Lack of communication channels to the technical teams make it difficult to execute a change. Misunderstanding of emergency changes. Sometimes the technical team may misunderstand between urgency and emergency changes. Scalability across large organizations. Scalability is a big challenge since some of the CIs may not be deployable in the existing infrastructure and the change management team will find it difficult to solve this issue. Vendor or contract compliance. Suppose vendors own change management system or even otherwise may resist from following the change management process in organization. In the next screen, we will discuss the service asset and configuration management process. The service asset and configuration management process manages the service assets to support the other service management processes. Organization cannot be fully efficient or effective unless it manages its assets well, particularly those assets that are vital to the running of the customer's or organization's business. Click each tab to understand the purpose, objective, and scope of SACM. The purpose of SACM is to ensure that the assets required to deliver services are properly controlled. In addition, it is important to store accurate and reliable information about the assets and ensure the information is available anytime. The objectives of SACM process include Define and control the components of infrastructure and services. Maintain exact configuration records. This helps an organization in complying with corporate governance requirements, controlling their asset base, optimizing their costs, managing change and release effectively, and resolving incidents or problems faster. The scope of SACM is to make sure that all assets used during the service lifecycle are within the scope of asset management. Manage the complete lifecycle of every configuration item. The process offers a complete overview of all assets and shows who is responsible for the control and maintenance of these assets. Let us do a quick recall of the concept of SACM covered here.
A configuration baseline is the configuration of a service, product, or infrastructure that is formally reviewed and agreed on. This serves as the basis for further activities. The configuration baseline can be changed only through formal change procedures. It captures the structure, contents, and details of a configuration and represents a set of configuration items that are related to each other. A configuration baseline is the snapshot of the configuration of a CI on that particular time interval. This can be used for comparison in the future. A Configuration Management Database, or CMDB, is a database to store records of configuration items. One or more CMDBs can be part of a configuration management system. CMDB provides a logical model of the IT infrastructure as it captures CIs and the relationships that exist between them. Similar to CMDB, there are two libraries defined as a part of the configuration management system. These libraries are used for controlling and releasing components throughout the service lifecycle, for example, in design, building, testing, deployment, and operations. In the next screen, we will discuss the Definitive Media Library. The Definitive Media Library, or DML, is a secure store where the definitive, authorized, and approved version of all media CIs are stored and monitored. The DML is the only source for build and distribution. The master copies of items stored pass quality assurance checks. The DML includes master copies of all software assets such as scripts and codes, in-house and external software houses, management tools and applications, and licenses. Let us discuss CMDB and DML in the next screen. The image illustrates the relationship between the concepts of CIs, CMDB, and Definitive Media Library. It also explains how they are used to roll out new releases and deployments to the live environment. The big rectangle box represents the CMS. The DML and the CMDB are a part of the CMS. During a new release, authorized CIs are taken or checked out of the DML and used in the development environment to create a new release. The new release is tested in test environment before being rolled out for deployment in the production environment. All the documentation about this release is kept in the release record and related to associated CIs in the CMDB. Let us focus on Secure Library and Secure Stores in the next screen. Secure Library is a collection of software, electronic or document CIs of known type and status. Access to items in a secure library is restricted. A secure store is a secure location where IT assets such as PCs, server, and other hardware are stored. In the secure store, definitive spares are kept. Definitive spares are spare components and assemblies that are maintained at the same level as the comparative systems within the live environment. In the next screen, we will focus on the logical model of SACM. The Configuration Management's logical model of the services and infrastructure is the model. It is called so because it is a single, common representation used by all parts of the IT service management and beyond, such as HR, finance, supplier, and customers. The image depicts the breakdown of two business services, e-banking and e-sales, into constituent IT services and components, or CIs. The services provide a user experience which depends on the availability and SLA. These services also depend on IT applications, which are governed by certain business rules and underlying infrastructure, such as data services or web services. This infrastructure is housed in a data center and connected by network. This might not be the actual architecture of the services, but logically such a model lets the customers and service providers provide an overview of end-to-end -end services. This is enabled by Configuration Management System. 
In the next screen, we will focus on the relationship between CMDB, CMS, and Service Knowledge Management System. The image represents the relationship between CMDB, CMS, and Service Knowledge Management System, or SKMS. Service Knowledge Management System is the complete set of integrated repositories or databases that are used to manage knowledge and information. The SKMS includes CMS, tools, and databases. The SKMS stores, manages, updates, and presents all information that an IT service provider needs to manage the full life cycle of its services. The purpose of the SKMS is to provide quality information so that informed decisions can be made by the IT service provider. SKMS consists of information such as the experience of staff, records of peripheral matters, for example, user numbers and behavior, organization's performance figures, suppliers and partners requirements, abilities, and expectations, typical and anticipated user skill levels, etc. The CMS is maintained by SACM and is used by all IT service management processes. Two major components of CMS are CMDB. It stores configuration details of the IT infrastructure. Known Error Database, or KEDB, the database created by problem management. The database is used by incident and problem management. Now let us do a quick recall of configuration management in the next screen. The Release and Deployment Management, or RDM, is one of the phases of the service transition lifecycle. This process aims at building, testing, and delivering the capability to provide the services specified by service design. In the context of ITIL, a release is a set of new or changed CIs that are tested and will be implemented into production together. Release management is responsible for planning, scheduling, and controlling the movement of new or changed services in the form of a release package. This applies to both the testing and the live production environments. Deployment management is responsible for the movement of new or changed hardware, software, documentation, or other configuration items into the live production environment. Release management is responsible for planning and scheduling the release. Deployment management is the actual team who implements the changes. Let us discuss some facts related to release units and release packages. A release unit is a part of a service or infrastructure that is included in the release in accordance with the organization's release guidelines. For example, an organization may decide that the release unit for business critical applications is the complete application to ensure that the testing is comprehensive. A release package is a single release unit or a structured collection of release units. It includes all the elements of a service such as infrastructure, hardware, software, applications, documentation, knowledge, and so on. A release unit of a business critical application, documentation, operations, and end user training together constitutes a release package. Let us understand the purpose, objective, and scope of RDM in the next screen. An effective RDM enables the service provider to add value to the business by delivering changes faster and at optimal cost and minimize risk. Click each tab to understand the purpose, objective, and scope of the release and deployment management. The purpose of the release and deployment management process is to plan, schedule, and control the build, test, and deployment of releases. The purpose is also to deliver new functionalities needed by the business while ensuring that integrity of existing services is protected. The objectives of the release and deployment management process are to define and agree release and deployment management plans with customers and stakeholders. Create and test release packages that consist of related configuration items that are compatible with each other. Make sure that all release packages can be tracked, installed, tested, verified, uninstalled, or backed out. Record as well as manage risks, deviations, and issues related to a new or changed service so that necessary corrective action can be taken. 
and ensure that there is knowledge transfer. This will enable the customers and users to optimize the service to support their business activities. The scope of release and deployment management includes defining processes, systems, and functions to package, build, test, and deploy a release into production, establishing the service specified in the service design package before handing over to service operations. It also includes all configuration items required to implement a release. In the next screen, we will focus on release policy. The release policy is the primary strategy for releases and is derived from the service design phase of the service lifecycle. The policy includes the following. Description of the release with its unique identification, numbering, and naming conventions. This will indicate the types of releases and how they will be identified and tracked. The roles and responsibilities related to each stage of the process. This will help to identify who will be accountable and who will be responsible for what activities in the release and deployment process. The expected frequency related to each type of release. The approach in which changes should be accepted and grouped into a release. The mechanism followed to automate the build, install and release distribution processes for improvement, repeatability, reuse, and efficiency. This policy statement typically identifies use of automation in release and deployment. How the configuration baseline for the release is captured and verified against the contents of the actual release. For example, hardware, software, documentation, and knowledge. In other words, how the release and deployment process manages the integrity of the CI change and CMDB. Entry and exit criteria and authority for accepting the release at each stage of service transition and into the controlling training, test, production, and disaster recovery environments. Criteria and authorization to exit early life support and hand over to service operations. Let us discuss the types of releases in the next screen. The three types of releases are major release, minor release, and emergency release. A major release contains large proportions of new functionalities. It is also known as a major upgrade that supersedes any preceding minor upgrade. For example, Windows Service Packs. A minor release contains small enhancements and fixes. A minor release or upgrade supersedes previous emergency fixes. For example, upgrading the routers with the latest versions. An emergency release is linked to an emergency change. For example, Microsoft releasing an emergency patch to protect Windows from malicious attacks. Another key concept in release and deployment management is the approach taken to deploy the releases. Let us discuss this in the next screen. In the release design, different considerations apply with respect to the way in which the release is deployed. The most frequently occurring options for the rollout of releases are Big Bang versus Phased push versus pull, and automated versus manual. Big Bang approach refers to the new or changed service deployed to all user areas in one operation. This will often be used when introducing an application change and consistency of service across the organization, which is considered important. The negative aspect of the Big Bang approach is that it increases the risk and impact of a failed release. Example. Installing the Office software for 500 users at one stretch. Phased approach means the service is deployed to a part of the user base initially, and then this operation is repeated for subsequent parts of the user base via a scheduled rollout plan. This will be the case in many scenarios, such as in retail organizations, for new services being introduced into the store's environment in manageable phases. The push approach is used where the service component is deployed from the center and pushed out to the target locations. Example, pushing the antivirus software upgrades to the connected PCs from the server. The pull approach is used for software releases. The software is made available in a central location and users are free to pull the software down to their own location as and when required. Example, informing the employees to pull the software from the server when required. Automated refers to automating releases using technology. 
This ensures consistency. The time required to provide a well-designed and efficient automated mechanism may not always be available or viable. Example, the common live updates from the vendors for their laptops and desktops. Manual approach refers to distributing a release manually. This approach monitors and measures the impact of many repeated manual activities as they are likely to be inefficient and error-prone. Example, installing the required Microsoft Office upgrades when required. In the next screen, we will focus on the four phases of release and deployment management. The four phases in RDM are release and deployment planning, release, build, and test, deployment, and review and close. The first phase is release and deployment planning. In this phase, plans are created for developing and deploying a release. This phase starts with change management authorization to plan a release and ends with change management authorization to create the release. The second phase is release, build, and test. The release package is built, tested, and checked into the DML. This phase starts with change management authorization to build the release and ends with change management authorization for the baseline release package to be checked into the DML by Service Asset and Configuration Management. This phase happens once for each release. The third phase is the deployment. Here, the release package in the DML is deployed to the live environment. This phase starts with change management authorization to deploy the release package to one or more target environments and ends with handing over to the service operation functions and early life support. There may be many separate deployment phases for each release, depending on the planned deployment options. Review and Close This is the fourth and last phase where experience and feedback are captured, performance targets and achievements are reviewed, and lessons are learnt. This marks the end of release and deployment management process. The next process and service transition phase is knowledge management. We will introduce this concept in the next screen. The ability to deliver a quality service or complete a process depends on the ability of those who are involved in it. The ability depends on their understanding of the situation, consequences, and the benefits, which is collectively called the knowledge of that particular situation. Some facts related to knowledge management are Knowledge management provides support for the capture and effective publishing of knowledge which surfaces during the service transition lifecycle phase and elsewhere. The quality and relevance of the knowledge rests on the accessibility, quality, and continued relevance of the underpinning data and information available to the service staff. In the next screen, we will discuss the purpose, objective, and scope of knowledge management. Knowledge management is significant within service transition phase because testing and validation data is gathered in this phase prior to release into the live environment. Click each tab to understand the purpose, objective, and scope of knowledge management. The purpose of knowledge management process is to share perspectives, ideas, experience, and information. Make sure that the information is available at the right time and in the right place, which will help to take informed decisions and improve the efficiency by minimizing the need to rediscover knowledge. The objectives of knowledge management are to improve the quality of management decision-making by ensuring that secure and reliable information is available for the service lifecycle. Ensure the right information is delivered to the appropriate place or person at the right time to enable informed decisions. Maintain an SKMS that offers controlled access to information, knowledge, and data that are appropriate for each audience. The scope of knowledge management is to provide knowledge throughout the service lifecycle and Manage knowledge, information, and data on identity of stakeholders, available timescales, or resources, and acceptable levels of risk and performance expectations. 
Knowledge management is visualized using the Data Information Knowledge Wisdom structure. Let us discuss this structure in the next screen. Data Information Knowledge Wisdom, or DIKW, is the heart of the knowledge management. Effective sharing of knowledge requires the development and maintenance of SKMS. This system should be available to all information stakeholders and suit all information requirements. Data is a set of discrete facts. Most organizations capture significant amounts of data every day in form of metrics. Information comes from providing context to data. This requires capturing various sources of data and applying meaning or relevance to the set of facts. For example, reports on metrics. Knowledge is composed of the experiences, ideas, insights, and judgments from individuals. This requires the analysis of information and is applied in such a way to facilitate decision making. The use of wisdom enables an organization to direct its strategy and growth in competitive market spaces. Wisdom provides the ultimate understanding of the material, also having the application and contextual awareness enables a strong common sense judgment. Quantitative data from metrics are transformed into qualitative information. By combining information with experience, context, interpretation, and reflection, it becomes knowledge. Ultimately, knowledge can be used to make the right decisions, which come down to wisdom. Tools and databases can be used to capture data, information, and knowledge, but wisdom cannot be captured in this way. Wisdom is a concept relating to abilities to use knowledge to make correct judgments and decisions. Let us summarize what we have learned in this lesson. The purpose of the transition, planning, and support process is to provide overall planning for service transitions. Change management covers changes to baselined service assets and configuration items across the service lifecycle. Service asset and configuration management provides the information required to manage CIs and assets across the service lifecycle. The purpose of RDM is to plan, schedule, and control the build, test, and deployment of releases. Knowledge management ensures that the information is available in the right place and at the right time. Next, we will have a look at few questions based on this unit.